One opposed the Bush tax cuts and the other one increased taxes in his own state. I don't have a record of any of those things. Second big thing, entitlements. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, those three programs, 40% of the federal budget. Okay. And growing. There's 72 entitlement programs, ladies and gentlemen. What's an entitlement program? Anybody define an entitlement program for me? Something for Take from me and give to you. Okay, well, that's one way to define it. <laughs> can't argue with that, but that's one way to define it. Give me programs. The entitlement program is one that provides uh, for the benefit No. no. <laughs> that's not that, that's not an entitlement program. This is very important to understand because some people say, "Oh, don't talk about Social Security. It's not an entitlement program. You earned it." No, that's Social Security is an entitlement program. Right? Social Security is an entitlement program. Medicare is an entitlement. Don't, whether you paid into it or not doesn't really matter as far as whether it's an entitlement program. What an entitlement program is? Socialist. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Mitt Romney at the Iowa State Fair. <laughs> Entitlement program, entitlement program is a provision in law that says if you meet certain requirements of the law, you are entitled to the benefit, thus an entitlement program. So if you paid into Social Security X number of quarters, 10 quarters, and you reached a certain, met a certain age of eligibility, you are legally entitled to the money. That's what makes it an entitlement program, all right? So we have 72 programs that either by age or by income or by payments or whatever, people are entitled to money from the federal government. All of those programs, well, I shouldn't say, most of those programs, certainly the vast majority of the money that comprises those programs are uncapped entitlement programs. So, all right, how many people can, anybody here tell me how much we're going to spend this year on Medicare? Raise your hand. Anybody know? You're wrong. Anybody else? You're wrong. Okay. Anybody else? You're wrong too. Why? Because nobody knows. Nobody knows. Okay? You can't know. Why can't you know? It's an uncapped entitlement. Whatever seniors consume is how much we spend. Can you imagine? I mean, I love my mom. She's 92. But I'm not going to give her my credit card and say, hey, mom, go for it. Have fun. But that's what we do to every senior. Here's the card. Go for it. Okay? But that's, that's what the entitlement programs are, and they have to be changed. Now, just so you know, the Medicare program has been changed by Obamacare. Obamacare puts a cap. Now, you, I'm sure you will talk to your liberal friends and they'll all go to their grave denying that that's the truth, but that's the truth. In addition to the cap, they put in a mechanism to enforce the cap. Anybody know what it's called? Death Okay. Stop asking you questions yeah. if you're not going to say I know you guys are frustrated. Not a lot of people come and talk to you as conservatives from Washington. <laughs> the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Okay? Independent Payment Advisory Board. Look it up. Understand what it is when you talk to your crazy friends out here in California. What it does, it's a 15-member independent commission that has no oversight by Congress or the President that can set forth reimbursements for doctors and hospitals to keep Medicare under that cap. That's all they can do. And Congress can vote up or down on it. What will happen when, when we say to doctors and hospitals, we're going to pay you less and less and less and less to cover more and more people? They simply will do what they're doing already, right? What they do with Medi-Cal. They don't take any more patients, and therefore you wait. The reason we can afford, ultimately, Obamacare or would be able to afford it is because simply people will die waiting and not get care. It's called ration. It happens in every socialist country in the world, and it will happen here. One candidate on the stage tomorrow night will have had 
experience in successfully ending a federal entitlement. Anybody want to guess who that person is? You. Very good. <laughs> In 1994, I, I was on the Ways and, House Ways and Means Committee, and I wrote the Welfare Reform Act of 1994, which was ended up in the contract with America, and when I got elected to the Senate in 94, I managed the bill on the floor of the Senate, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Ted Kennedy. And we went to the American people and talked to them about a story. She's real important if you want to lead this country to be a good, teacher, a good teller of stories, providing a vision to America. So I started out my speech about telling you who America is and what we are. Ronald Reagan had great policies. Most conservatives who run for office have great policies. The gift of the president and of good leaders in Congress is the ability to communicate a vision that people will rally behind. I know there's folks that are running for president right now who say, oh, well, I'm a CEO and I'm a, you know, I know how to fix things. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States is not a CEO, not even close. You try to tell any member of Congress, I'm the president, you do what I tell you. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> good luck telling the American people, this is what I want to do and you will follow me. It's not how it works, folks. These folks who think they can be CEO and just run the country and fix the problem, Reagan wasn't a CEO, he was a leader. He was a communicator. And by the way, not only do we need a leader to lead this country once they're elected, we need a communicator to get elected. Look at ever since the, the television became the dominant media, this is the mid-1970s, every single presidential election has been won by the better communicator. Every single one. That's not to say that they were good communicators. George Bush was not a good communicator, but he was a hell of a lot better than Al Gore and John Kerry. Yes. <laughs> That's what we have to remember as we elect and nominate the next person for president. We communicated a vision about welfare being a program that caused dependency and destroyed families and people. And Americans understood it to be true. And so they forced President Clinton, who didn't want to sign this bill, 20 Democrats to join us in ending a federal entitlement. Aid to families with dependent children, gone. The left went crazy. Here are two senators from California. I remember, remember, I mean, I always remember Barbara Boxer coming with pictures of people in bread lines and almost in tears. <laughs> that part I wasn't upset about. But, uh, and, and as if people in poverty were disabled, <laughs> that poverty was a disability that they couldn't overcome. But we passed it, and guess what happened? We cut the welfare rolls in half across America. Employment went up among those on welfare. Poverty rates went down. The poverty rate among African American children, which was always the worst measure in poverty, went to its lowest level ever, four years after welfare reform passed. And today the welfare rolls are still substantially lower than they were even in 1996 and we're in the third year of a recession. It made all the difference. We can do that with Medicaid. We can do that with food stamps. Food stamps, the highest level ever. Why? Because President Obama is going out and pushing the states to sign people up to food stamps and Medicaid. Why? I know. Votes. So you have someone who's been able to do things on the economy, on the moral cultural issues, there's nobody who's been out front more, 